It's time for Gamecock Pod Daily with Keith Alsep. For the next three to four years, I'll be committed to the University of South Carolina. This is Rogers again to the 25, 20, 15, 10. Rogers scores! And now, live from Studio 54 of the Gamecock Pod Studios, here's the cockfather himself, Keith Olsen. All right, everybody, welcome in to the Big Thursday Show for March the 16th, episode number 1180, and we'll just get right to it. This is our March Madness preview show. I will be joined in just a moment by Sumter and Bryce from the Gamecock Basketball Only podcast, and so Aaliyah Boston joins elite company becoming one of only five players to be an AP All-American all four years. That's pretty cool. One of 10 players to be named to the first team AP All-American women's team for three consecutive years. Zaya Cook, who had been an honorable mention All-American named first team or third team, I'm sorry, AP and U.S. Basketball Writers Association All-American, and Bree Beal, who is one of four finalists for the National Defensive Player of the Year. She is uh, also an AP honorable mention all-American. So it looks like Sumter is not going to be able to join tonight, but Bryce is going to join. And so let's go ahead and bring in Bryce from the Gamecock Basketball Only podcast, who was actually just on the Garnet and Black Town Hall, bringing some heat. Bryce, how's it going, my man? Doing well. That town hall is fun. Those group of guys love the Gamecocks and it's good you guys get together and it's good to complain together. It is. It's, it's like going down to your local pub, right? Like the guys from cheers. Hell, you're probably not even old enough to remember that TV show, (laughs) but it's just a neighborhood bar. It's all your, a lot of your closest friends. You get together once a week you, you throw down a, a few beers or maybe you have a whiskey or, uh, you know, if it's after the, the Florida or Georgia football game, maybe you're just completely smashed by the time you leave. But you get together with all, all your friends and you talk about the thing you love the most that you have in common, which is the Gamecocks. And uh, it's, I call it, my my Gamecock family, and uh, those are my ride or dies, and and it's really cool, and um, it, it's great. We've been doing this since the pandemic broke out, and I mean, about ninety percent are the same guys every single week. I mean, so it's people that I would have never known. Now we're we're like family. We're Friends, we have get-togethers. When I come out for a football game, I get to see them. At the bowl game, there were several people, several that just are uh, patrons to the podcast that I've never even seen, but I knew their names. 
And uh, so it's really cool. And so, hey, I don't know what an FDU is, but they are laying it on Texas Southern in the first four. I don't even know what FDU is. Maybe uh, something Dickerson, I believe. Oh, fairly Dickinson. Well, yeah. There you go. Well, I guess it's too long to put up. I actually, I've been on the campus of fairly Dickinson. It's Where in New that? Jersey. Okay. And uh, my uh, first real job in pharmaceuticals, we were at a uh, Florham Park, New Jersey, which is right where fairly Dickinson is we went over there and uh it's pretty cool where would you it's, rather live texas new jersey or south carolina oh man um i would new jersey is the armpit of the <laughs> east coast so that's out happened, georgia it's out i would <laughs> if i was single i'd rather live in atlanta <laughs> or miami but Atlanta would be more affordable. Well, Keith, let's talk basketball. Breaking yes. news. Clemson might lose to Moorhead State. We'll see how that ends up in that second half. <laughs> so, hey, Bryce, so I said this on Monday's show. South Carolina, not only do we not Clemp beat Clemson, we knocked them out of the college football playoff. Yep. Lamont Paris, probably – the most unexpected of all, although maybe football was or would have been. Yeah. They beat Clemson and that bad non-conference loss to an 11 and 21 team. They're out of the dance. Their was dance like, card was taken away. Was that it like was Frank, stamped null and void. Was that like Frank Martin 2.0, Brad Burnell? Just like yes. – Oh my gosh, I, we deserve this. We have the resume. We're third in the conference. It doesn't mean crap. You lost to Louisville and South Carolina. Deal with it. Anyway, That's it's just right. Frank Martin 2.0. I love it. I love it. And then we we beat them two out of three in baseball. First time since 2011-12 school year that South Carolina sweeps Clemson in the big three in men's sports. And in doing so, knocks Dabo out of the college football playoff and Brown Brownell, who I've known since the 90s when he was Jerry Wainwright's assistant at UNC Wilmington. A nice guy, but he's got the personality of a cardboard box. You know, just a plain brown cardboard box. Not even a banker's box. Is him and Dave Dorn hanging out together? I mean, at least Dave Dorn wins. I mean... <laughs> I mean, that's like J.C. Sherford thinks Dave Dorn is the worst college football coach in America, but dude wins. He's winning. And how about the baseball? I, I was at that Carolina-Georgia game, basketball, and we were, you know, watching it on the phone. And what, what were we down? Seven to one in the seventh and come back and just rally. Yeah, well, then it was 11 to 7, and then we had to hold on for dear life and, and won 11 to 9. And then we, I don't think they've beaten us in women's basketball since Vietnam. So, <laughs> good morning, Vietnam. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, God. And bless how about basketball, Keith? Um, we talked a little bit, but just the, the bracket. I can't believe, I can't believe UConn got a number two seed. I can't believe it. Well, I mean, Gino said if their name was anybody other than UConn, they would have been a number one seed. Oh I mean, gosh. what kind of Kool-Aid is he drinking? Well, well, it's not the water because he throws the water bottles at the refs. Yeah, I, I think it's too much wine. Is Italian heritage? I mean, so look, I've been to Napa and Sonoma, right? The wine tastings—they they pour you like a just a sip in the bottom of the wine glass. When you go to Tuscany, 
every pour is a full glass right. of wine. And so when you go on one of these wine tours in Italy, you're gone after a few places. You're sloshed. <laughs> Okay, because they have the olive oil, the bread, the, right. the cheese, right? All that. And then they take you and you have one of these three and a half hour, eight course Italian dinners. And you're by the end of that, you've already had like three more or four more glasses of wine, which is just another bottle of wine you've consumed. <laughs> and you're just passed out on the side. You're just ready for somebody to carry you to the bus to get on. And I think Gino, he's just had too much wine uh, in the Kool-Aid. I, think I was really shocked Stanford was a, a one seed. I, I think it was by default because of how talented their roster is. Who else would you have given it to? You know, Stanford, I guess they had a good resume and they faltered later in the year, but they had the wins. Their non-conference was almost as good as Dawn's, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, I think that's really what got it for them because, you know, they had some bad Pac-12 losses. Southern Cal beat them. Destiny Littleton. Oh, great game by her. Great yes. game. I actually went back to Southern Cal because she is a star there. And she's from there. Didn't and, she start there and then go to Texas? Well, well, so she signed with them, and then they fired Cynthia Cooper, who was okay. the coach. And so she never enrolled. She was released from her national letter of intent. I interviewed her when That's she right. was at Texas. I went down and met her at the student center, and we sat outside and had just a great talk. What an unbelievable young lady. And – she wished that she would have gone ahead and gone to South Carolina then, but she went to Texas and uh, that lady, she got fired right after that. She, uh, her and uh, Pat Summit's old assistant, those two did less with more than any other coaches in the country. And uh, Karen Aston, I think she got a small, maybe she's in San Marcos at Texas state or, and Holly Something Ward, man. she went to like SEC Network, and she was one of the worst analysis oh. people I've ever seen. Oh, yeah, she's another one that's got a well. But I was surprised UConn got two. I thought she was they were going to be a three because you know they lost to Marquette. What St. John's down the stretch? I mean, just now Marquette made the tournament. I will say this: we were talking about this in the town hall. Our bracket. I felt like you supposed to get the worst number two, and we got Maryland with Diamond, who they're going to be a different team from when we played them early in the year in College Park. Then you got UCLA, who was sneaky dangerous with us, Keith. They had us for, what, 37, 38 minutes. Now, that was earlier in the year, and I think we've even gotten better since then. But And then you got Creighton laying around, and then what is it, Oklahoma, number one team in the NCAA in scoring at number five? Yeah, but here's the team. Notre Dame, if Olivia Miles is healthy, they've been really good. And Niall Ivey is my second favorite women's coach. Um, I mean, Maryland, to me, after Iowa, is the toughest two seed. If Olivia Miles is healthy. Notre Dame probably wins the ACC tournament. Probably a two-seat. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, they, depending on her health, they could be the best three-seat. And then UCLA as a four. I mean, I'd rather have Texas. I'd rather have Tennessee. Tennessee's going to beat some people, Keith, though. I don't think we want them too much. but They they are, beat. but it's because they're not in our regional. I'd rather have Villanova. I, I mean, to me, that was the best four seed, I think, is UCLA because they, they don't play real fast, but they got good guard play. They, they can shoot it. But 
I think Maryland is really the X factor here because it's like they said on the on the show on Sunday when South Carolina plays you the second time, it's usually worse than the first time. You got it. But here's the deal. Diamond Miller did not play, and Maryland had young players and transfer players, and that was a November game. To me, Maryland is a will be a completely different team than the team South Carolina saw in November. Your thoughts? I still think we're a 10-point team point better than them, even on a neutral court. Um, I mean, do you call – you call Greenville a neutral court? I guess you can. Uh, <laughs> uh, negative Ghost Rider. 80, 80% Gamecock in Greenville. Um, yes, the pattern is full with fams. But um, the Diamond Girl's good, but be honest right now, between Cardoso, Boston, and Cook, I, and then, you know, you got Beal, you even got Fletcher, who will be back to full health. I mean, there's no one stopping us. We, we, the only way we're losing a game is if we have a bad game and the other team has a breakout game. And that, I'm going to put that like at a 2% chance, if that. All right, so here, here's a, a dark horse that nobody's talking about in our regional is Arizona. Kate, Kate Reese. Here. What have they been doing? Kate Reese was injured a good part of the season. She's back healthy now. They played better. Uh I know they got the girl that hit that game-winning shot against us from Kentucky, right? Wow. Uh, she transferred to Arizona. I think they're a dangerous team for that half of the bracket. Like, if I was not going with chalk, um, you know, with, with a Maryland or a UCLA, to me – and I want us to do this with every bracket. I want to break each of the four brackets down. To me, Arizona is the dark horse team to challenge South Carolina on our side of the bracket. If I'm if I'm picking one team that's not chalk, I'm going with Arizona. Can they get past Maryland though, Keith? Well, I mean that'd be that'd be the upset, right? Like, I mean, are they going to be the Creighton of the bracket last year? I mean, that's a possibility. It that is a possibility. So, I mean, Oklahoma. I'm just not a believer in the Big Twelve. Like Texas won that league. I still don't think they're very good. They are tough. Oklahoma can score, but. South Carolina is the only team capable of beating South Carolina. Agreed. I mean, that's just how I see it, at least until you get to the Final Four. Then it's a different deal because if Stanford plays out of their mind or Indiana, who I do believe is the second-best team in the country, let's go to their regional next. Okay, so they are a one-seed – they get one of the uh, first four on the women's side yep. play-ins. And so then they get the 8-9. Uh, South Carolina gets Marquette and South Florida. Marquette did beat UConn, but they were not at full strength. Right. So Oklahoma State, Miami, Washington State, who won the Pac-12 tournament, they play Florida Gulf Coast in the 512. Villanova, who also beat UConn, who had they have a good program. I think they have one of the top two or three scores in the country at Villanova. U, UCLA, not UCLA, UNLV, 31 and 2. Do they play anybody this year? Jeez Louise. They must not, but Michigan. I like that program. Then you've got LSU as the three. And then, again, I guess I love the seven seeds. NC, NC State. Good. NC State with 
the the coach with the worst two pay in America, uh, Wes Miller. I mean, they have players, they have talent, and they could bust that side of the bracket because I, they have more players than LSU has. They've had some last, injuries. NC State was last team to beat us in Columbia, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. That was a COVID year game. I remember that. That was a sad. Anyway. Yeah, don't don't that's say they said she didn't recognize uh, that team. It must have been the Sigma Nu imposters from the 1961 Carolina Clemson game. And they had that six five girl who was just a force that year. Anyway, yeah. that's in the past. She gone. Yeah, and uh, I will say this, Utah, who was probably the best team in the Pac-12 at the end of the year, even though they didn't win it, they're the two seed there, and so I think that's a real challenge, and I think that's a brutal – that's a brutal side of the bracket when you've got – LSU, NC State, and Utah on one side of that bracket. That's a that's a murderer's row right there, those my, games. My guess, Indiana, LSU is going to get out of that. That's just my guess looking at it initially. I just think LSU, they're going to push some people around. I don't think they have the bench to go farther than probably that Elite Eight, but – LSU is going to push in Indiana. They ain't no slouch. There's a reason why they got one vote for number one this year. So I'm going to say Mulkey's teams at LSU have not performed well in any tournament. Upset both years in the SEC tournament, early exit NCAA. I think that continues and so I'm going to say the winner of Utah NC State, they will play Indiana in the regional final. Ooh, okay. That that's my pick. That's that's my pick there. All right. All right. My so guess, let's. My guess is Indiana. They're going to come to play and have something to prove. I think they're going to get out of that bracket. <clears throat> is there? I mean, is there anybody – I don't see – like, I know Washington State's hot, but now you had a week to cool off, right. right? I don't know that anybody really pushes them on that side of the bracket, quite frankly. I just think they have too much shooting and they have a legitimate post presence Six, and they play really good team defense. So I, I do think Indiana uh, – Indiana and South Carolina, they fly to Dallas. All right, so let, let's move to Seattle and, and let's go to uh, the South Carolina side of the bracket. So the Gamecocks, uh, this is deja vu, Bryce. <laughs> if, chalk, if chalk prevails, okay, Stanford and South Carolina in 2017 – met in the national semifinals in Dallas. And if that game would have been played outside of Dealey Plaza, okay, multiple Stanford players could have been arrested for assault and battery on Asia Wilson. But you hear Dawn, she didn't complain once about getting bruises. I'll tell you that. That's right. And for – Two years now, all you hear is other coaches, including Leatherface, Tara Vanderveer. (laughs) Okay. Talk about just uh, South Carolina. They just push you around. They're just so physical. Well, hey, do you remember in 2017 when Asia Wilson had to play the second half with – Cotton stuck up her nose, and she had a black eye. Do you remember that? All right, let's let's examine the Stanford Regional. That's the Seattle Four. 
So Stanford, they, they get a play in, then they get the winner of Ole Miss, Gonzaga. I bet you Nothing. Ole Miss will give Stanford all they want, though, and that's in that next round, round of 32. I bet you they'll give them a little bit, give them a little action. I think they'll hang around for a while, but I still believe South Carolina and Stanford have the two most talented rosters in the country. For whatever reason, Stanford – I don't know if they're bored, if they've been complacent because they know, you know, all those girls have played together just like South Carolina's, uh, the Freshies have been together, Haley Jones, Cameron Brink, and all of them. You know, the, the complacency and the fact that they play in the Pac-12 could have gotten to them. I don't know what the issue is there, but I do believe they have the second most talented roster in the country, but they've not played like a top four team uh, at least in 2023. I mean, Keith, think about that game at Stanford. If we, if they keep up their scoring in that fourth quarter, they beat us. But our defense was just overwhelming in the fourth and finally broke them down. Cameron well, I mean, Brink. That, Cameron that's Brink two was, years in a row. Cameron Brink was out playing Boston for most of that game. Not many people remember that. Now, Boston closed it and finished it when it mattered. But it, it was about to that five, six-minute mark in that fourth quarter before that game changed. I think we went on like an 18-2 to two run right. on the road. Brutal. I know we scored like the first, I want to say either 11 or 14 points of the fourth quarter. Like Stanford had a double-digit lead. 12 points or something like that, 12, 13. Yeah. And so for the second year in a row, you know, South Carolina has trailed Stanford going into the fourth quarter in the regular season. They won both games. Um, what do you think about Texas – coming out of right below Stanford there. Have you seen so them? So you got, you got Louisville. You could have a 4-5 uh, Louisville and Texas. Texas has good guard play, but I just don't think they, they have enough. I just don't. I mean, again, to me, the stronger side of the bracket is the is the other side of the bracket because Iowa is the two seed. They very easily could have been the one seed. I think that's why they are in this regional together. Like, those were the two teams they were deciding over who was going to be the last number one, and so they put both of them in the same regional but Duke, you know, I think they won the – didn't they win the regular season of the ACC? Carol Lawson, I really like her. Colorado, they beat Stanford. Georgia as a 10 seed. Dangerous at 10. Dangerous as a 10 seed. I haven't really seen that much from Florida State, but to me – Iowa and Duke and Colorado, there are three teams there uh, that could beat Stanford. Well, my pick uh, of the upset of the bra on that whole bracket, I have Middle Tennessee shocking Colorado. Oh, wow. I'm surprised. You know, I could see that. Uh, I could see that. They're dangerous from three. They got a chance to beat Colorado. I mean, here's the thing. Caitlin Clark, are you going to be able to beat Georgia or Florida State at home? Georgia, are you going to get beat? Right, or, right. Georgia, Georgia could beat Creighton. They could get Creighton by the Bulldogs because I'm really impressed with them. I'm impressed with their coach. I'm impressed with how hard they play. They weren't scared of us. They didn't back down to us. They were not scared of us. I'm impressed with how well they shoot the basketball. And 
I mean, Iowa's got to get past the second round. We'll see. I, if they I can gotta, do it. I gotta see it, and then, and then, Carol Lawson. I mean, I just don't know. I know everybody. I mean, they, the nation, and the networks are going to want the Stanford Iowa sure. regional final. You know, just like they're going to want UConn and Virginia Tech. Right. Right. Like, I don't really think it matters in our regional. I mean, there's nobody's going to be opining, maybe Notre Dame, right, if Olivia Miles is healthy. What did ESPN put a graphic out that said the last, like, was it the last 10 years? It's like 335 to one, the top four seeds in the first two rounds. Yeah. They, they, there's only been one loss in the last 10 years by the, the top four seeds. In women's basketball, it's about talent and size. If you got it, you win those first couple rounds. That's right. No doubt about it. So, so you think Iowa, Iowa Stanford makes that regional final? I do. But Iowa's got to show I, it though. They haven't I, done it yet. Right. Like to me, like Duke could take them out. And but I just see I think unless Iowa makes the the regional final, I think they're the only team that threatens Stanford. Stanford would have to have just an abysmal shooting night not to move on. Iowa though, I think can legitimately beat Stanford because of the spacing. Low, low, do they have a dominant big girls down low? No, they don't, but they space you out and they drive and kick and knock down threes. And they have a they have a decent post presence, not a dominant post presence. If Stanford wants to win any game, they can do it. The question is, are they going to want to do it and show it? Because in the big games, they play well, but then they lose to these medium-level teams, and you're going, did they even care about this game going in? Right. Like, that. that's my point with them. Like, I think the committee des- decided, hey, Stanford, because of their talent, they probably got complacent. Maybe they had some injuries. They lost some conference games. So I think I'm I'm picking Stanford to move on. It wouldn't be surprising. Punch their ticket to Dallas. But don't get They're, me wrong. Wouldn't you love oh, to go to Dallas and have Iowa there? And oh, tell them what's up? Oh, the field of dreams, all the corn. I would, would call would that Kevin up. Costner be there. Well, he might quit halfway through the season. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, he he likes doing his Fox Nation show more than doing Yellowstone. I'll tell you that. Um, but it'd be great if you have what I mean: South Carolina, Iowa, Indiana. I guess we got to talk about that fourth bracket. Yeah. So Tech, they got hot in that ACC tournament. They did, uh, and so. By virtue of them winning the tournament, they they get the uh, third number one seed in the Seattle three region. They would meet the winner of Greenville two, which is probably going to be Indiana or, like I said, the winner of Utah and C State. Bryce likes LSU to make the regional final there. And so I got to say, I'm not going to be a bit surprised if USC does not beat Virginia Tech in the second round. That is the toughest 8-9 versus a 1. I mean, I don't – South Dakota State. The Jackrabbits. The, the Jackrabbits. We played they're them good. Yeah, they're they're decent. They're legit, but Southern Cal, I think, is capable of knocking off the Hokies and sending the Hokies home before they can do the hokey pokey. 
Do you think they actually have the Hokey Pokey song playing at Virginia Tech? I don't know, but here's the thing. that It is in Blacksburg. Right. Right, because that is a second-round game. And West Coast teams going east, you worry about the jet lag, you, you worry about the circadian rhythms, the biological clocks. But to me, that's the they're the one seed that has the most danger in the second round, I think, is Virginia Tech. I agree with that. And then they got Tennessee lingering. North Carolina's capable of beating anybody if they want to play hard. Ohio State, they've been up and down all year. I don't know if I trust them. <clears throat> and then you got Alabama. Don't it wouldn't be shocking for them to upset Baylor. And then you got UConn, who is they're not going to have any problems until they have to play a team with depth, a good team with depth. Because you know they got maybe six girls that they can play. So I think now seven because uh, Caroline Ducharme is back and AZ is back. And so I think that brings them to like eight healthy scholarship players. It wouldn't surprise me though. And then you got Iowa State who can hit, they're pretty good from three. I mean, Ashley bracket, Jones. I probably call this bracket the second hardest bracket. I mean, it, it is, it is a, going to be the the toughest bracket for the number one seed to navigate in my opinion because if Virginia Tech they survive Southern Cal they're probably playing Tennessee and Rakia Jackson and Jordy Horston are a dynamic duo for sure and I think they you know here's the thing though I don't know if Tennessee can stop Elizabeth Kitley. Like, that's the difference is Virginia Tech, they have a legitimate low post threat who is like Aaliyah Boston that can step out into the mid-range and face up. And so – I mean, if Tamari Key was at Tennessee and she had been healthy all year, Tennessee would probably be like a two or three seed, right? So, I mean, it's that's a different ball game. Uh, but to me, Iowa State, Tennessee, that's a game that Tennessee could trip up on. I mean, they move the ball. Ashley Jones can play inside and outside. They're very capable of – lighting it up from three like Iowa. And so to me, that's a very intriguing four or five matchup there. Honestly, I I see Virginia Tech playing Tennessee in that Sweet 16 game. I mean, I could see that for sure. So on the other side of the bracket – North Carolina, they get a, a play-in game. Ohio State, I mean, they're the three seed. They just get absolutely boat raced. You see them in, in the, the uh, Big Ten tournament? Yes, they lost by over 30. I mean, in the semifinals. How do you do that? Honestly, I don't see UConn getting any competition no, yeah, I think I think UConn breezes through that side of the bracket because there's just nobody tough enough that will bruise them up and that Gino will get pissed off because of Nika Mule getting, you know, battered and bruised. But I don't think Tennessee, if it came down to it, and that's going to be in Seattle. So my guess yeah. is – Virginia Tech's going to overpower them because even though Tennessee's got those athletic wings and you got Jackson coming back next year, which is impressive. I can't believe she's coming back. I well, think we'll see. Let's, let's, let's wait and see. But Virginia she Tech. She has a big tournament. She could be the two pick. But that Virginia Tech with that post player down low, I know it's, not, it's not a sexy pick 
you know, you're not going hard and, you know, shocking the world when you take the number one seed out of there. But I see Virginia Tech playing UConn. In that I moment. agree. And I think it just depends on – I mean, you just don't know with UConn game to game how many bodies they're going to have, how many players are going to show up. And so that's why it's hard for me to pick them. Like if it was etched in stone, UConn, they will march through their bracket completely healthy. AZ Fudd, Ducharme, you know, uh, Sanchez, Aubrey Griffin, you know, all of Nika Mule, all of them. If, 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 if it was etched in stone, UConn will be completely healthy. I would pick UConn to win that regional. But to me, that's the toughest one to pick because you just don't know if, if how many players UConn is going to have in any given game. And Virginia Tech, they've never been on this kind of stage. How do they handle that? And if UConn gets one, if Hood gets hurt again, I mean they, they can only you know sustain. Yeah, they're injury. they're done. Yeah. yeah. I mean, at that point, like in if if they in their side of the bracket in the Sweet Sixteen in Seattle, like if they get North Carolina, and they have one, they're down one or two players. I could see the Tar Heels beating UConn. I mean, it's a. I'm not trying to be finicky on that, but literally UConn, it's a game to game kind of situation with, with their roster. Who knows? I mean, at the end of the day, shocking. I always want the shocking thing to happen, right? I just, I just don't see UConn losing and I don't see Virginia tech losing to the, the final, but who knows? I would love some shock and awe. I wouldn't mind nine Gino complaining at halftime or to the refs that, you know, he's a little crybaby now. So, yeah, I mean, if, if, if UConn went out like in the Sweet 16, oh, love that. Oh, I, I, pity, oh. I pity the sideline reporter that has to talk to him. <laughs> Holly Rowe. They ain't sending her to Seattle, baby. She, she'll be in Green Vegas. You can count on that. But All it right, should, hey. be, should be a good women's bracket. I'm excited. Uh, I'm going to the games, uh, taking off work on Friday, and uh, I'm excited. I think Norfolk State, they're going to not know what hit them. And then I'm excited. I, I hope Marquette wins. I'd love to see Marquette on that Sunday game. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be an intriguing matchup. I mean, South Carolina, I don't think it was last year. I think it was – two years ago played Gonzaga in one of those tournaments and Gonzaga's pretty good, but it, you know, I'm looking at the wrong bracket. It's all good. Just watch Marquette, out. Marquette, South Florida. Yeah. So I, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's kind of like Charlie Cream said, if it's South Florida, eh, if it's Marquette, maybe they can hang for a little bit. But I just don't see the Freshies in their last game in front of the fans at Colonial Life Arena on Sunday afternoon or evening. They're not losing that game. It's just not happening. I mean, South Carolina's going to the Final Four. Indiana's going the Final Four. I think, you know, probably Stanford or Iowa. I don't think Duke can beat Stanford. And you wouldn't. Iowa be would just have to shoot it out of their mind, and uh, Caitlin Clark would have to go for like forty. And it wouldn't 40 surprise points. you to see all four number ones in the Final Four either. No, it really wouldn't. I mean, but I'm going to make a bold prediction that at least there will be at least one number one seed that will be not making it 
to Dallas. It ain't going. I mean, we we ain't going to be losing. I'll tell you that it ain't going to be one of us losing. That's right. All right. So thoughts on the men's bracket? What I mean? Yeah. I mean the Kelvin Sampson redemption. I mean, hell, that guy could have been our coach like three different times. Keith, in basketball, we got Darren those Horn. coaches always get second, third, and fourth chances. I'll tell you that. And you know what? Even if they cheat, steal, shoot people, they still get a shot somewhere. And, I mean, that guys he's a winner. Bruce Pearl. Bruce Pearl, you know, he loves those backyard barbecues, having all those kids over and their families with a bag of cash, I'll tell you that. Sean Miller, Xavier, a three seed. Man, Ray Tanner, do you think he's got a picture of Sean Miller on his wall? So hey, so let's since I'm in Texas, let's go with the with the Houston uh Kelvin Sampson Redemption regional first. Okay. So they get Darren Horn in the first round. So one of our former coaches and one guy that definitely wanted the job when Eddie Fogler got it. Kelvin Sampson. Darren Horn is at Northern Kentucky. Darren Horn's a loser. He is a loser. So here's a here's a fun little story, Keith. So uh, I work at a company called Colonial Life that happens to have the rights of the arena, and our our uh, president um, bought Darren Horn's house when he was moving out of town, and let's just say that guy didn't leave the house in a good situation. After storming out, him and his wife weren't the nicest people to meet. I'll leave it at that. So let me tell you. So I had two players at Western Kentucky with Dennis Felton. And he left and got the, he got the job at Georgia. One uh, had graduated. The other uh, had an ACL injury his junior year, so he redshirted. So his first year he played for Darren Horn. They were both from Bulgaria. Uh, Tador, he he could hardly speak English. I have a great story that we'll have to tell you off the air. I can't say it on air. But these two kids, I'm sitting, we're at the big time tournament in Las Vegas at Christmas. And we play somebody in uh, this round Italian-looking guy what comes across the floor, calling my name. It was Sonny Vaccaro. Stops me to compliment me on how well my team plays, all that. And so then my guy, Bob Gibbons, who, like before the internet, he was the basketball guy in right. America. And uh, so, uh, Philippe Bidnoff, he was a 6'4 kid that he had every one of Michael Jordan's turnaround jumper moves. He, both the Tador was 6'9, 230. Philippe was 6'4, about 190. Both of them could run two miles through the mountains in under 11 minutes. And they both had a minimum of a 38-inch vertical. Bob Gibbons told me, he's like, why is that kid going to Western Kentucky? He could play for Duke. I was like, well, they placed him in my prep school, and I protected him. And nobody saw him play until after they already signed, because they signed the early signing period. And um, so, I mean, you just never know with, but, but anyway, getting back to the point, Darren Horn. So, Tador, 
he had no virtually no family. And so a friend of mine's family adopted him. They became big boosters at Western Kentucky. And Western Kentucky, Darren Horn went to Western Kentucky and nobody up there had a good thing to say about him. Like he completely used and abused the business community, never paying for food, never paying for dry cleaning. I mean, not tipping, just being a total jerk. And they could not wait to get rid of him. And so they gave Eddie Fogler a glowing review of him. We got stuck and, with him. And, and I knew it from day one, the guy was just garbage. I mean, he rode the back of Tom Crean and Dwayne Wade because he recruited Dwayne Wade to you mean Marquette. Tom, ult, ultra tan Crean? Yes. And so Houston is going to beat them by like 40. I mean, I would love it, it. it's happening. Would love it. So, I mean, I will say Auburn, Iowa, the 8-9, that's an intriguing uh, second-round game for them. Auburn, not the same Auburn of years past. I know they Very can play defense, but they ain't scoring like they used to. That's true. So, here's the, here's the beauty, though, of this regional there are three teams from the state of Texas. And if you look at the bottom, Texas is the two seed. Texas A&M is the Ooh. seven seed. And so in the second hurt. round, you could have Texas, Texas A&M in the NCAA tournament. When's the last time they played, Keith? Is it when, before, when they bro broke up the conference? I think so. Wow. And, and look – my guy, Rod Terry, he has got Texas playing better than Be – Chris Beard had him playing this year. And Buzz Williams, I mean, Texas A&M, they make the SEC championship game, and I'm watching the lineup introductions. Their backcourt, they were first and second team all SEC – I mean, man, they are really put together, and they still got blown out by Alabama, and they are a really, really good team. I feel like they got shafted for the set to get a seventh pick. I mean, to be a seventh pick. I mean, and and then you got Xavier, Sean Hall's Chop House Miller. Yeah, he was never there. But, I mean, you got Pitt, who's played well at times. Should have lost night, but they won. Indiana's a four seed. I mean, this is a very in, intriguing regional, but just that bottom part of that bracket with Texas and Texas A&M and then, uh, you know, Xavier looming – in the distance, I mean, you may not have enough if you play Texas, Texas a and Well, no, so that'd be – so that'd be like a Thursday, Saturday. And so then you'd recover, right? You'd have yep. until the next Thursday or Friday right. before those next games, which I think you would need. So you if, if Houston – comes out of their half of the bracket, they could be playing another team from Texas in that regional final, either Texas or Texas a and I've seen Houston play about four times this year, and they are just balanced. I'm going to call them dominant and balanced. And, and unafraid. They got athletes galore. It's that team. Do you remember when um, Bruce Pearl hit his peak at Tennessee and he had those guys all 6'5 to 6'8"? They're just athletes. That's Houston. Houston ain't losing in that bracket. I'll tell you that right now. The only thing they have, the, the only thing you can hold against them is the conference they're in. 
I mean, I still think the winner of Texas, Texas A&M could win that regional. When's the last time Texas performed in the NCAA tournament well? Well, I'm just saying it was when they fired Rick Barnes. And now you see what Rick Barnes is doing. And they're, we'll, we'll get to them sure. later. Um, all right, so Alabama, the overall number one seed. Houston, the number two overall seed. I think they're cruising. Wouldn't you love to see a College of Charleston Furman second round though? That that would be interesting for and sure. Pat Kelsey, who some might say would have been the great coach to be a great coach at men's basketball at Carolina. Or the guy at Furman who wanted it more than everybody else. You mean Bob Ritchie who went to North Greenville University with me? Yes, Bob Ritchie. <laughs> So here's the thing is 512 and 413 either Charleston or Furman one is going to be in the second round. I don't I think agree. both will be, but historically I think college, of Charleston, college of Charleston could easily beat San Diego state. I might even call that my lock upset of the tournament. Yeah. I don't, I don't think Kawhi Leonard's there anymore. Didn't he go to San Diego State? I think, I think so. he did. So, I, I mean, I just think Alabama cruises through that side of the bracket. You look down, Arizona. Watch out Missouri. Missouri is, how about Dennis Gates, first year just getting athletes and just well, balancing. Well, guy, Charlton Young, sitting on the bench with him. Well, he's got That's a killer guy. staff. Keith, what does he have that Lamont doesn't have? He's got a killer staff. Yes. He does. And he's got better players and a better roster. But we have That's the shot doctor. We have the shot doctor. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> I mean, I do think Missouri, Arizona, I think that's a very intriguing second round matchup. But I like it. I, I think the spoiler on that on the bottom side of the bracket could be NC State. Kevin Keats coached against him at, when he was at uh, Hargrave. Well, he better he finally figured it out to make the tournament. He's been – what did he come from, UNC Wilmington? Yep. He and replaced my been, guy, Jerry Wainwright, at been UNC been lingering over there at NC State? Would you say he's kind of been lower than the expectations? Yeah, but I tell you what, though, I think he's got a shot now because those two legendary guys eight miles apart, Roy Williams and Mike Krzyzewski, are they not know. walking the sidelines. They're not walking through that door. Uh, who would thought that North Carolina and Duke? I mean, it's hard to follow the guy. It's hard to follow the guy. Yeah, you don't want to be the guy that follows the guy. Ask Will right? Muschamp. He loves that. Yeah, like you you don't want to be the guy that follows the guy. Like I wouldn't want to be the coach at Alabama after Nick Saban, but I would love to be the guy after agree. the moron that has the ego big enough to take that job. I mean, it just doesn't work out. But so, I, think, I think Missouri could be an upset. I mean, I, I like your NC State pick, but my guess at the end of the day, unless Alabama has a game like they had against us, which you know what is possible. They could. But if Brandon Miller does Brandon Miller things, he closes every game he's in. He's a closer. I mean, Alabama's roster is just sick. And we were – I don't even know how hey, that happened. One night – for two hours in Columbia, we were yeah. better than them. Yeah. Until Lamont Paris put a certain defender. Oh my God. Still by that might haunt me all year. I have he to took he t I think he had three timeouts in his pocket when you go to overtime. Brother, in a game that close, you never have three timeouts in your pocket. I mean, at that overtime. point that night, I know we're going off topic a little bit, but we this is Gamecock Pod, but 
it, just double team Brandon Miller and let anyone else. Yes, anybody else. Hey, Did they have anyone that break ten points that night? But Brandon, they Miller? had one guy who scored, I think, ten, and that was it. Like, I absolutely agree. I said it on my podcast. I went nuts. I mean, there's no chance I'm letting that guy get the last shot at the end of the game and at the end of overtime. Or Some, foul him. It's going to be tip of the hat. I'm doubling. I'm running. I'm getting the ball out of your hands. If you swing it, two passes, because one pass away, I'm going to defend it. And a guy hits a shot or the buzzer goes off and it goes to overtime or it's over, yes, okay. But Brandon Miller is not getting the last shot. I Again, I said it on the Garnet Black Town Hall, I've said it, the worst end of game coach in America right now that I've seen is Lamont Paris. All right, let's go to the bottom half of the bracket here. Got Purdue, man. Matt Painter. That seven-foot center they got is a tank. tank. He is, but he's also slower than molasses. And so. And also, I'm going to say this right now. Tennessee is soft. And when they're not playing the game. No, they they're, are not. Rick I'm Barnes does soft. not coach soft. Ah. Uh, there, there's some games in the SEC play this year that they did not show up and didn't want to be there. All right, so I do like Purdue, Matt Painter. He's my guy. He was uh, assisted at Southern Illinois with Bruce Weber, and uh, they had placed a kid at my prep school. They had a, a private plane, the Salukis. They flew down Ooh. into Johnson City on a private plane. They got some casino cash? Well, I don't know. But uh, Matt Painter, so here's the thing. I think the best 4-5 matchup in the tournament is Duke-Tennessee, and I'm just calling it the winner of that game is winning that regional. Well, I'm just going to disagree with you. I just I – don't, I don't see Tennessee getting out of the – well, I'm saying I don't know that they they beat Duke. Duke has the length. They have the shooting. They Duke don't have has the, the talent. They don't have the coaching, though. Well, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say that in league, they don't have the coaching cachet of having the legend and the winningest coach in the history of college basketball on the sideline. Like that game against Virginia, when the dude is going up to dunk it and clearly gets fouled, and the whistle blows with two tenths of a second on the clock, you can't tell me if Mike Shashevsky is the head coach at Duke. That guy is shooting two free throws, and Duke is probably winning the game because he's just got to make one of two. They're not waving it off and saying no play and going to overtime. No chance, no how, no way. Also, that Kentucky Providence game, don't be shocked if Kentucky goes down to Devin to the Friars. Carter. Devin yes. Carter and the Friars. Devin Carter's the second best player. Ed Cooley. Hey, Cooley is a recruiter. And he you know what? What do you say about him? Didn't he make the NCAA tournament almost every year? He does. Yeah, I see – I'm not – like that 6-11, it's kind of like the 5-12, right? Like a lot of times the 11 advances. I think I would pick the Friars there. If not, I definitely think uh, they would go down to Kansas State. So, Marquette, are they really a – They are. They didn't play a lot of people this year. They won yeah, a lot. I mean, I'm still. I got. I got the winner of Tennessee, Duke, cutting down the nets. Wow. In that regional. Wouldn't that's you my. Love, 
that's my Cinderella story, even though it's Blue Bloods. I mean, a, a four or five. I just think one of those teams has a at least a four game run in them. Do they stand out, Matt Painter? Death taxes, Matt Painter. That's right. More more consistent than a few good men on a sun, rainy Sunday afternoon. I mean Purdue. I know their big man might be slow, but if they have a you know half court game, they can draw it up and score points. But I'm curious to see what happens there. A um, lot of lot of athletes. Sure. Duke, Tennessee, even Memphis. All right, so uh, Bill Self and the Hair Club for Men. <laughs> They, they had the West Regional. And uh, Bill, he's been under the weather. And uh, hey, it wouldn't so, surprise me if Arkansas gives them a little gives them a little run in that second round game. I bet you Arkansas, even though when we played them, we should have beat them, but that was another coulda, woulda, shoulda game. But Arkansas's got the athletes. But that what's that kid at Kansas, the white guy that's just making three after three after three? Yeah, I mean, they're they're really good for a reason. But I tell you what, I love Eric Musselman, and I think he's probably got the hottest wife of any – coach in the tournament and he's got assistant coaches that will threaten you if you're a reporter too did you see that that, that, that is true <laughs> so, so you, like, you, like so you got them the yeah and then illinois uh the the former frank martin assistant might have been the best coach in the frank martin tree of coaches I mean, it's Brad Underwood. It's hard to argue with the results there. So that's a really. This is a tough regional. That's a really intriguing second round for a number one seed to be getting Arkansas and, and Illinois, who both have athletes and guys that, when they're on, can just fill it up from outside. Hey, watch out for Gonzaga and St. Mary's. I know they're in the, what do you call their conference? The WCC? West, West Coast. Coast. West Coast. And uh, now St. Mary's got the best of Gonzaga this year. Gonzaga's but still got the players that have the experience. And what is it, Timmy with the worst mustache in the game? Yeah, he. it kind of reminds me of uh, Jimmy Foster. Very similar games, very similar mustache. Wouldn't surprise so, me though, Gonzaga so, or any of the, you know, I mean, UCLA's good too. I mean, this, this would you say my this guy Mick Cronin? He's this, only he's only about the height of your coffee table, but he can really coach. This bracket's tough. That's a tough bracket. It, this is a very tough regional because TCU is very good as well as a six seed. Gonzaga, you can't count them out. Northwestern's back in the tournament. Mick Cronin, I mean, UCLA, they will guard you. I just don't know if they've upgraded offensively enough. I think that, to me, the dark horse in this regional, though, is UConn. It wouldn't surprise me. And then Iona, isn't that coached by your boy? Rick Patino, isn't that Iona? Am I wrong? Rick Rick Patino. Rick, Rick, I like the, the call girls Patino. So I work Kentucky's camp and every every coach you could get one night, you would go up after dinner and you'd sit and you could ask Rick Patino one question. And so then I'm working Dave Odom's camp. 
and uh, they had this tall, lanky kid walking around campus. And uh, my guy, Larry Davis, he would later become the head coach at Furman, but he was on staff. Jerry Wainwright was there. And so Wainwright Davis said, hey, Keith, you want to stick around and uh, help us work out this uh, freshman we got coming in? Who was that? Timmy Duncan. You're kidding. So I got to throw bounce passes and lob passes to Tim Duncan for about half an hour. Did Duncan know he was that good at the time? I don't, nobody knew he was that good at the time. Was he kissing it off the glass as a freshman? Oh, yeah. I mean, he was like a big fundamental. I mean, he he, he was always the big fundamental. The only guy, like, and I know it's a dispute, and, and it goes to him over Kevin Garnett because Garnett played for the Timberwolves for so many years, just wasting away in Minnesota. But Kevin Garnett was on my 16 under AAU team. And, uh, I mean, I just couldn't believe how good he was. And he was scared to death he was going to get cut from the team. I mean, he's, he's just always been the most in, intense, even as a kid. Basketball meant everything to him. But, yeah, so – did you call him the medium ticket back then? No, I did not. I just called him Kevin. Um, I don't even know how we got off on that. We were talking Iona and Rick Patino. We oh yeah, Rick Patino. Yeah. So I mean, you call. Oh, and 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 then it, uh, I think it was that. Yeah, it was that same camp. Richard Patino was a camper. He was a 12-year-old camper, and I coached him. He was on my team in the in the uh, team, you know, when you played games. Did he a uh, coach at Minnesota? Yes. Yes, he was. And he didn't do anything there, did he? Didn't he kind of poop out? He, he won, and then they – after all that stuff with his dad happened at Kentucky, I think it – just had a huge effect on him. So well, he, I mean, I'm like, I'm like scared to death that whole week because if you piss off, like if, if Rick Patino's son, if you're coaching him all week and he makes a phone call to his dad, your coaching career <laughs> could be over. And so it was like one of the most stressful weeks of camp even though the highlight was like that first day of tossing passes to uh young wow. timmy duncan so i don't know i don't know about i, I think i got you I, I got uconn coming out of that regional i'm not going with bill self the only reason he won one was because memphis absolutely choked it away from the Free throw line, John Calipari and uh, Derek Rose. They definitely should have won that national championship. Well, watch out. I'm going to call it Gonzaga or UCLA. Going to come out of that bracket. Mick Cronin, that's my guy. All right. So, I mean, what are you thinking about? What are you and what are you hearing about? What's going on with Lamont Paris and the transfer portal? Well, I'm glad we waited to record Monday night because it was the transfer portal slash, you know, departure day for men's basketball teaming. And no, nothing personal to Benson and Manat. They didn't get minutes this year, and if they weren't going to get minutes with a whole new team, whole new staff, they weren't going to make it. So, not surprising they you know, they jumped. And then I guess it broke a few hours earlier today that Ford Cooper dropped, but he was still a walk on, so no open scholarship there. But um, I keep hearing that BBV is going to come back next year, and that's surprising. Oh to God! Me. And not personal to hear he's he's trying to get his law degree. I, I get it. 
but he is not D1 caliber. I mean, when they subbed in Manat in the Georgia game, he played great. He played better than the BBV. Like, to me, that is, well, you came here for the old coach, and this is my guy, so I'm playing my guy. To me, Trayvon Manat probably – I'd rather have him because he can move his feet. BBV Statue. is like a guy that just stepped into freshly poured cement and stands there for two minutes and then tries to move. You ever I seen mean, a guy with 2% body fat be that bad? I've never even heard of a guy having 2% body fat. Well, the guy is all muscle, but I'm telling you, he – and, again, it's not personal – he can go to a small school. Have yeah, he, he needs to hit the road. Have him go to Charleston Southern and get some minutes. Yeah. But outside, yeah, I agree. Of that, outside of that, if he would leave, I think that would take trim the fat that we were talking about in the town hall. That yeah. um, if you if you can get him out of there, but then again, Lamont's a loyal guy. I just I think if he's there, he's not even worth the scholarship, but I know that sounds mean, but it is what it is, Keith. But outside of that, I think we talked about on on our pod earlier this week, we're going hard after Mac, but every other school in the Southeast is too. And then um, you got um, Stephen Clark from um, Citadel, who is good friends with Hayden Brown and Hayden Brown had nothing but great things to say. And, and I will say this, he's probably the equivalent of Hayden Brown in terms of, quality of player but i'll take six eight yes all day because if you know lamont plays him at the four he can actually play the four now he needs to gain weight and get into the weight program but if somehow we can land mac bj mac what a name add the ie on there and you got mackie i know between him and clark i know it's socon players and that kind of turns into a narrative but i was saying on the on the town hall he lamont knows the socon build on those relationships. I would take those guys and we'll call ourselves the SoCon All-Stars like we thought yes. we were Malachi Smith and Hayden last year. And yes. Malachi went somewhere else. But take those guys, and you know what? I'll take those guys over a player from a D1 program that has sat the bench. BBV. You got it. Yeah. I, I'm, your- I'm with you. I don't mind taking the mid-major, the best players off the mid-major teams. I mean – Hey, I think my my guy uh, Mike Young, you know, took took a, a guy or two from Wofford to Virginia Tech and went to the NCAA tournament. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I don't have a, a problem with it. I mean, basketball and football is a different animal. I mean, you just never know. Guys develop, you know, and and they can play at a higher level. You know, like I know there's this six five uh sharpshooter from Army that they're trying to get, you know, that they're heavily in the mix with who, you know, he's ready to bug out of West Point after one year and I know it's tough. He's got the year, size. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind those kind of guys. I, I like Hank and Sanford. I like Zach Davis, even though he didn't get that rebound. Hey, in that one three one, he's long, lanky, and he he is he's he he's, he's a stud. How to get rebounds when when it needs to happen, and he needs to be able to make a consistent jump shot. Right, and, and Colin Murray Boyles is it going to oh, be? A, he's a top one hundred player. Is going to be the steal of that yeah. class. He is the one of the most dominant players in one of the best high school leagues. Who would have thought him leaving AC Flora, who's what, 4A, and going to Utah? And you're like, why are you going to Utah? And he has shined in every tournament. I've yeah. seen him on national TV five times. Yeah. Boyles is a winner. And mm-hmm. what is he, 6'7, 235? Put yeah. on a little more muscle here. He is going to be a dominant four. Yeah, I mean, he could be kind of like a Ron Slay type of guy who I pl- uh, coached against at Oak Hill, and then he went to Tennessee, and he was the SEC player of the year when he was a senior. 
So, I mean, the, the power forward position could be promising because you got him coming in, Hank and Sanford, right? If you, if you get this kid from the Citadel, he could be a stretch four uh, for you. And you Max, really need a you need a guy that could be a stretch five. That is the missing piece. I don't know if Cesar Edwards is going into the portal. I'm not. What's your take on Miles Tate? I'm not really that hot on him simply because he doesn't have much eligibility, and you know there's a certain situation looming at Lexington High School. I don't want to muddy the waters there. Well, Keith, you can't disagree with his high school pedigree. He was a winner, and he even got minutes at Butler his freshman year until he got his, you know, his ACL tear his sophomore year. But he doesn't have size. He's but five he, they had that six nine dude that's really good. That's a Clemson. Well, on that, team that Clemson too. team just lost to Moorhead State, so. Uh, he ain't doing that too hot up there. But, you know, he did have Hall playing with him to make it made him look good. But I would say this, if we strike out, if we strike out on the Army kid and a few other guys I think we're looking at, um, he's a safe pickup, but he's got, I think, two years left with the, the um, COVID year. I just, if we have, if we can get Crawford and Cam Scott, and we know that, and they say, you know, I'm assuming they're asking, are you okay with us taking this kid? You need to ask Cam Scott, but that's if he's, you know, going to come here and stuff like that. But is, he's a he's a guy to keep warm, Keith, is what I'm going to keep it at. He Keep him warm because that's he's, what better, I think. he's better yeah. than a Joe Schmo from Charleston Southern. He's got minutes in, in D1 basketball and a pretty decent conference. And guess what? A second chance. Things happen for those local kids. I mean, you always want to take a flyer on a local kid if he wants to come back here. The only thing I have against him is he's coming off an injury and he's on the smaller side. And no offense, we got Jacoby Wright at 6'1", 6'2". We don't need any more small guards. And we got Eli Sparkman, who's 6'1", 153. Hey, play Sparkman all day long. That guy's shooting 70% from three. Yeah, that's a very small sample size. <laughs> but anyway, at the end of the day, Keith, we've talked all year, you and me and Sumter. If we go and we hit at, at least at minimum in the transfer portal, we want two power forwards, a small forward. And then if we have a fourth spot, you might take a guard if you can get one, but it needs to be the right point guard because you got Deba coming back. And Deba, if he comes back somewhat healthy, 6'6", six, six, and with size. And what did he average? Almost seven assists at Coastal. We just – well, what do we lack all year, Keith? A point guard that could drive and get to the, the bucket. And now until Michi lit into the year, Michi figured it out that last two, three weeks of the season. But – Having a guy that everyone has to collapse on and you can dish it out for a three. Right. That That's the key is Michi doesn't have to be ball dominant to get his shots because Ebo can set him up and then he can guard the small forward you got on it. the defensive end. You bring so Ebo I do think that's a forward. critical yep. – that's a critical piece – uh, because I think the kid from Westwood there in, in Blythewood, he's going to be more of a developmental I think he's going to be kind of a role guy, but he knows. He can shock. But my guess is wouldn't you like him to have the Justin Mackey path and by his junior, senior year be that guy that you can depend on? Because six six, and if he gains some weight, we don't have a lot of wings laying around at six six. No doubt. No doubt. All right, so there you have it from Bryce, the co-host of the Gamecock Basketball Only podcast. And so should be on Friday a yawner for Dawn Staley. I mean, I know Norfolk State was applauding, and they showed them, and I was like, man, y'all are getting ready to get beat by 70. I know you're psyched. Like, they'll probably be like, 
getting wanting you know like Dawn Staley and Aaliyah Boston's autograph and all of that stuff. I feel bad selfies after the game. We have a MEAC team the other year, Hampton. We beat them 50 plus. I think they scored four points in the first half. It could be one of those games. It could be. But Keith, I got to mention this. We got a GBO bracket out there on the ESPN Tourney Challenge. Join it. Get your guys to join and uh, see if you can beat Sumter and I's middle aged men bracket position. Bracket predictions. There you go. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that. Hey, stick around because I, I got to tell you that. Uh, yeah. That tidbit. Now I got to remember what it is. All right. So that'll do it for the Big Thursday show, episode 1180, the March Madness episode of Gamecock Pod Daily. Keith, what are, where, are they else, where else are they going to get that much basketball talk? I can't yeah, think of nobody. No, no website. No, nobody's doing it. 107.5, you can't get it. I'll take Just don't any, get it. I'll take anyone over the 107.5 crew. No offense. Oh Heath Klein, I like now it. I got I to take up for Heath Klein and my guy, Will Gunter, on the early game. But I'm – that lunch I'd, have crew, to, I'd have to be up at 5 a.m. my time. To... <laughs> Thanks for well, having me on, Keith. I had a good time. All right. That's that's it for a wrap for the week. We're taking Friday off. We'll be back next week. This has been the March Madness special on Gamecock Pod Daily. God bless, and you guys have a great weekend. You know, this weekend is – when the most vasectomies will be performed in the United States. All you guys, uh, keep your eyes uh, cold. That's I'll, I'll, I'll save you a beer that. at St. Patty's and five points too. <laughs> five points is going to overflow. GBO out. All right.